Sometimes you need to get coached. Michael Jordan is great, but he needed Phil to become the best Jordan he could. Mike Tyson, I love Mike. Say from Brooklyn, just like me. He said Brownsville, Brooklyn. But he needed cuss. Sometimes you need somebody to coach you, but you got to be willing to be mentored. You got to be willing to listen. You got to be willing to change your ways for the benefit of yourself. And that's not being selfish. Because once you're good, the people around you start to get better. Introduction. I am so humbled and honored to bring a dear friend of mine to the stage. He is the epitome of what a power move maker is. His resume extends beyond music industry exec, marketing exec, business owner, manager to the stars. This guy has seen it all and done it all in the world of entertainment. Please give it up for this week's Power Move Maker, Mr. James Cruz. Everybody, thanks for braving the weather. James. Let's get to it, Brad. Let's, Let's get right get to, to it. it. Let's get to it. I mean, there's so many things that, you know, that I can say on your behalf, and you have so many accolades. So. I think the best place for us to start is the beginning. How did it all begin for James Cruz? You know, I never ever even thought of Fathom being in the entertainment business. Um, you know, I probably come from the same place you guys come from. I come from the projects. And um, my mom, handicapped, public assistance, the whole story, no dad. Don't feel sorry, it is what it is. But um, I was a ball player. And there was only a few ways out the hood. Either you was going to jail, or you was um, having a great jump shot, or you pitched a great rock, physically and, you know, the other side. And I was a pitcher, I played ball. And uh, got signed at 16. Came home after I blew out both my knees and um, thank God my cousin was working at Polygram in the accounts payable department. And she said, you gotta get out the house, you gotta get, you know, come alive again. You love music, do an internship. You know, come get, get this job. They pay $100 a week, which is unheard That's of as an internship. Unheard of as an internship. And you got a, a Metro card to be able to go back and forth. And um, after two months, two and a half months, I worked for Ed Eckstein, the first black president of a major record label back in those days. There were no African-American, Latino presidents of major record labels. Um, he was Billy Eckstein's son, the jazz musician you probably already know. And uh, you know, we won the softball championship that year and I happened to be one of Ed's favorites. And uh, for some reason I got chosen to go out to California for 25 interns out of 167 interns, 25 of us were brought out to California. And there was one job for the, within the whole company for the best intern that year. And that job went to Jana Fleischman, who happens to be Jay-Z's publicist. Plus nice, Jana, because nice. she worked really hard for that. And she's doing a great job with JMB. Um, and uh, for some reason, Sincere Thompson, who used to run promotions at Polygram, he said he needed a wingman. They had KTU used to be Hot 97 back in the days. A lot of people don't remember that. Mm -hmm. 103.5 was Hot 97. And they ran a contest. And uh, these two Spanish girls won the contest, and they didn't speak English. But Sincere was hot on one of them. He said, yo, come up, to, um, come up to LA, come to the MTV Awards with me. I need a wingman. These girls don't speak Spanish. I need you to translate. So I was like, how's the other one look? He was like, she all right. So yeah. I, I knew what I was looking for right there. She all right. Yeah, she all right, all right. And I got up there, and um, we went to the MTV Awards, and Vanessa Williams was uh, presenting with Brian McKnight. Okay. And uh, Vanessa had her kids there, and uh, she saw me and snuck backstage, and she said, would you, you know, stay with the kids real quick? I said, sure. And then walks in that next time. It says, Cruz, the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I go, oh, man, it's like, you know, your dad caught you doing something you wasn't supposed to do. I want to see you first thing Monday morning, blah, blah, blah. So now, first time in L.A., first time really made, I'm around artists. I got Def Leppard over here. Everybody and their mothers in this Are you MTV still an Awards. intern at this point? Still intern. Still intern. Just got back from this little intern, you know, pilgrimage that we had to, to the West Coast. And um, got into work early. We started at 10 o'clock in the music business. I don't know if you know that. But you had to be in by 9.45 to start at 10. So I'm sitting outside Ed's office from 10 o'clock. He don't show up till 1.30. And he goes, come with me right now. And now... At Polygram, there are these long hallways, so I felt like I was walking to the electric chair. I thought I was in trouble. I was like, what did I do wrong? Like, I just snuck into MTV Awards. 
Now, this man, Ed Eckstein, busts open the door of Larry Stessel's office. Larry Stessel's our general manager. This African-American black man is busting open the door. This white man who's got his foot on his desk like this is on the phone. He jumps up, hangs up the phone. I said, now that's power for your ass. <laughs> Whoa, he got this white man running. Now, this is when O.J. Simpson, all these things were going on. So it was a huge racial divide in the country and within the music business. And he says, listen, Larry, I know you like hiring those uh, interns that have the college degrees. And I know you like hiring those interns that articulate and speak well. I want to hire, excuse my language, I want to hire the motherfucker who snuck into the MTV Awards. Get him a job. And that's how I wound up being a retail marketing assistant. And I, I actually reported to two different people, Nicole Desaine and Elisa Levy. One ran urban, the other one ran pop. So I actually had the opportunity to work the best of both worlds. So that was your actual start yes. into the music industry. Yep. Yep. Congratulations, <laughs> man. Listen, we wouldn't have won that softball championship. EdX, I wouldn't have paid no mind to me. <laughs> so. so I got a question off of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you feel a white space, especially you just spoke about a racial divide, yeah, right? Absolutely. But you worked in black music. Yes. You are unapologetically Latino. 100%. You know, Body you black. love your, your heritage, fluent in Spanish. Did that help you or did it hurt you in the beginning? You know, I didn't, I didn't play a race card in the beginning. I just worked work hard card. I just, I, if you needed the laundry picked up, you needed the coffee made, or you needed um, the checks to be ran. I remember Biggie came up there because they wasn't paying him one day. And Big was like, yo, Cruz. And I was like, whoa, like, you know, and I went and got him his check paid, you know? So it was just being able to do whatever it took at that time. But I had the opportunity because I was too light to be black and I was too black to be white. You know what I'm saying? So it was because the whole separation, but I was just a cool cat that was just there to do whatever it took. So, and one of the things that I love about you and I always compliment you off camera about this is your ability to network. You work a room like nobody I've ever seen before. I actually think it's admirable. Um, and I hear you mentioning at Eckstein now, mm -hmm. you're an intern, mm -hmm. Biggie. Mm -hmm. If you're not an intern at that point, you're in an entry level position. Mm -hmm. Your ability to network and make friends and relationships, is that a gift you were born with or is it learned? You know, I think it's both. I think um, I had this innate sense of being a social butterfly because I had to be supportive of my mom and she was kind of not very social. Uh, and I was, you know, she was 16 when she had me and um, I, I had to grow up really fast. So I was a lot older in, 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 in smarts and in relationships because I dealt with a lot of adults. Um, and then Tony Gio, who used to run the Copacabana, he was the ultimate concierge. And I grew up watching him work a room. I grew up watching Gungi work a room. And I would see how their relationships created business opportunities and how maintenance of those relationships maintained safety. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got the big baller fronting, you know what I mean, and a situation is about to happen, the person that could diffuse that had power. Not just power in terms of diffusing a situation, but power in terms of everybody wanted to be next to that person back then. Because it was a very dangerous time. I mean, you had a lot of, you had Howard Beach, you had Yusef Hawkins. There was a lot of racial turmoil going on during these times. And you, the clubs weren't separated. You had, you go to the Muse and they'd play hip hop from 12 to one, but then they switched to reggae from one to 130. And then you heard some top 40 music. We didn't have the black club, the hip hop club, the house club, everything was mixed. If you remember Mars, Mars had five floors and each floor played different music. So you had all of us actually entertaining one another, being around one another. But then this racial divide started to happen. And the person who could keep that calm was a person in power. And I always respected that power. I grew up with a few guys that are from a different side of the street uh -huh, than a lot uh -huh. of people. And I always respected them because they kept the peace. So I knew if I could keep the peace within myself, I could make everybody work harder together as a team. And that's why I guess I, I conditioned myself in that sense. Got you. So you leave Mercury. Yes. Well, Mercury. I didn't leave Mercury. You didn't I, leave I, Mercury. I didn't leave Mercury. So <laughs> Willingly? You, and, you know, it was, it was more of um, Leo Cohen wanted me to go over to Def Jam and run retail. So funny story. And look it up if you want. Met the Man's album was coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leo Cohen, as an intern, I, and I made a couple sparks. I was always out, you know, going to tunnel, this and that. And um, Lior said, introducing me to Russell. And thank God for Russell Simmons. 
He says, I got the number one retail marketing guy in the game. We got to hire him. We got to hire him. We got to hire him. So Russell, of course, says, well, if you're the number one retail guy in the game, how many records is Method Man going to sell? And I don't know where I guess the angel on my shoulder, my guardian angel, somebody came to me and spoke for me and said 122,000. And Russell says, man, if you got 122,000 records, I'll give you $1,000. And Lior said, you got 122,000 records, I'll double that with $1,000. <laughs> and um, he sold 121,872 records. Wow. And um, I was invited to the Def Jam Christmas party, which was the hottest party in the world. If you could get into the Def Jam Christmas party, you was on fire back then. And um, I go into the Def Jam Christmas party, and Lior goes, Russell, we owe him some money. Well, he goes, Russell, we owe him some money. And um, Russell says, okay, digs in his pocket, pulls out money, and Lior pulls out money, and I'm 22, 23 years old, and I'm seeing $2,000 in cash in my face. And again, my angel came to me again and said, no, 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 you guys keep that money. I might need a favor later on sometime. Not all money is good money. And not, when, not every time you're right do you need to remind people you are. Sometimes being right is just for you. And there's something else going on later on. And there's another plan for you that the universe has. So I didn't take the money. And then Lior had a, a, um, a great run with uh, Chris Lighty and Irv. And then I left Mercury, went to Universal Distribution for a New York rep. And um, Dawn Marie Gray was at Reebok and she was leaving Reebok. She says, James, you need to come over here. I was doing product placement before we even knew what product placement was. So if you look at the Benjamins video, Puff is having, has Reebok um, batting gloves on and Reebok cleats on. If you look at Mace's um, press shot, Mace has DMX sneakers on. So I was in with that because I knew if I would have went to Reebok, everybody would answer my call because I had free sneakers on the other line. And Reebok was the primary sponsor of the Rucker tournament up on 155th. So now I'm around all these rappers, all these street guys, but I'm holding my own because I'm the Reebok guy. Reebok was the first company to ever endorse and sponsor a major African-American-owned tournament. And that was Greg Marius, may he rest in peace. So I was up in there with all the rappers. And, um, you know, making a long story short, once I, once I did that job, you know, Puff said to me, he says, listen, when people see you, they see Reebok. I need people to see you and see Bad Boy. I need you to come work with me. Now, Puff and I have met for years in the parties, in the clubs. He's promoting Red Zone on Thursday. I'm doing Red Zone on Friday. You know, he's doing Emerald City. I'm doing Emerald City. You know, he's running around dancing for Father MC. I'm trying to run around dance for Musto and Bones. You know, there's a lot of comparisons there. Not a lot of people know that. And, um, you know, Sean was definitely with a beautiful, beautiful, incredibly spiritual, wonderful woman named Jessica Rosen. Can, 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 can I interject yeah, yeah. for one second? Sure. Because I think it's extremely important. There's so many gems that you just dropped. And I want to reiterate to anybody who's watching this on video, anybody who's in this live audience, number one, you started as an intern, mm -hmm. you get an entry level position in the company, but look at the names, like it's, it's never too early to make your presence felt. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with everything that you said, you keep your head down low, you let your work speak for yourself, but if you're really, really hustling and you're outworking the competition, People will notice you. Ed Eckstein, um, Lior Cohen, Russell Simmons, you get recruited to go over to Reebok, but not just going over to Reebok, but I love what you said about recognizing the opportunity, how Puff had, you know, Reebok, the, gloves. The Reebok yeah. gloves on, and you're like, hey, you know what? If I go over there, it's an opportunity for me because people will pick up my call. And through that, you're able to now, you've met Sean Combs before, but now your relationship deepens and he wants to start a business relationship with you. So, you well, know, you know just, the, the real reason why he wanted to, because they wanted to figure out how the hell we did that Allen Iverson lifetime deal, which wasn't me, it was Q Gaskins and Todd Krinsky, but I was very instrumental in making that happen. Because Allen said one thing, and back to this racial time, Allen was the number one hottest basketball player on the face of the earth and everybody was after him. It was like, you know, when LeBron was coming out because Chuck was it. His name is Bubba Chuck, sorry. And, um, but Chuck came to Reebok and said, how am I gonna put my life and my career in your hands when you have nobody in your company that looks like me, walks like me, talks like me, addresses like me? And at that point, people had to pay attention. It was important to have individuals from our backgrounds, individuals that understood the culture from the inside out to be a part of this corporate culture. I see. To be a part of this corporate culture and maximize the awareness, but also to establish communication with the stars. 
because Allen Iverson couldn't deal with Pete Roby, who happened to be the basketball coach for Harvard University at the time, even though he was a black man. He wanted to deal with Q Gaskins, who walked like him, dressed like him, talked like him, came from the same neighborhoods as him. He wanted to be next to me. He wanted to be next to individuals that understood the culture. So in knowing that, we took an opportunity and, and exploded it. And once that happened, Puff was like, hey, wait a minute, what's going on over here? And brought me over to Bad Boy, uh, which I always wanted to be next to Puff. I can't, I can't lie. For it to work between me and another client, I have to be your biggest fan. It just works better that way. That true belief in the other person and making their dreams come true makes my dreams come true. So whether it was Puff, whether it was Busta, who are probably my two favorite artists on the face of the earth, it was important. And then there's Big. We'll get into that later. However, what I will say is this. Had it not been for the need of African American and Latino individuals in corporate America, none of these opportunities would have came to light because we became such an important force in generating revenue. And that wasn't just about endorsement or sponsorship or, or any kind of equity ownership. That was just because they wanted to talk like us. They wanted to be like us. I remember doing a presentation where I brought Fat Farm and Cybertech and all these urban brands to show Reebok what colorways they should be making, to show them how they should be positioned, why their, why their sweat should be baggier than the cuts that they were making to speak to an urban audience. And that knowledge, that self-knowledge, that self-confidence that we mattered was part of the reason why I was able to do what I did. Wow. Wow. What was your role at Bad Boy Records? Well, <laughs> it started really easy. <laughs> it started as head of, promo excuse me, head of mix show and street team. So if you, don't, if you recall, Bad Boy was probably the first. If you talk to Steve Rifkin, it was the second. But it was the first street team ever. And, um, you know, Puff brought me over. And Jason Jackson was the vice president. And uh, Jason Jackson decided that he wanted to go manage Lauryn Hill. Now, my role was not so much as being a mixed show director. I didn't know nothing about radio. I didn't know nothing about street teams. All I knew was that if Puff threw me in a lake of water, I'd do the backstroke in two seconds just to show off to him. And he said to me when Jason left, what are you going to do? I said, well, I guess what do you want me to do? He said, sink or swim, you run promotion. And at that time, I was not necessarily the favorite person at Bad Boy because, you know, you had a bunch of interns that were there for years that wanted the role. The company was changing. It was becoming more from a smaller boutique label to becoming a juggernaut movement of social consciousness and awareness. And Puff had the vision to start to position the company in a certain way. He brought over Josh Take Me. He brought you over. There was a marketing division being created. I think Nantucket Nectars was like the first huge deal yep. Josh was working yep. on. Mm -hmm. And um, I was babysitting the street team with, with the street team van. And we were sleeping, driving back and forth to all the shows. But we had to be in the office by 10 and we get a, a day's pay docked. That's a true story. Remember that? <laughs> so, you know, my role became so much more important. Then I had to deal with Arista, the parent label. And I learned from two great guys, Tom Maffei who I thought was incredible. Good guy. Um, and um, uh, Clive Davis. And, uh, and being in those rooms, just the aura and presence just made you want to be best. Like playing next to Jordan. You're going to have a better game next to Jordan. Playing next to Puff, you know, I want to be Scottie Pippen. He could be Horace Grant, but we played better next to Puff. It would just happen. If we played on other teams, we played great, but we just played better next to Puff because he made you want to step up. And then uh, probably for two and a half years, we moved over to 1345. And... Um, I'll never forget, it came the time where we probably were like the hottest team on the face of the earth. And I had just gotten married and just had my first daughter, Alexis. And um, I had an offer from Bob Jameson at RCA. He offered me half a million dollars a year, 27 years old right now. Half a million dollars a year plus a huge expense account, excuse me, and a huge budget, a promo budget. And I had an offer from Dave McPherson over at Epic. And um, Puff calls me into his office. He goes, so you leave, huh? And I go, you know, it looks like it. He goes, what you gonna do? And I explained to him my options. And I said to him, then there's this other thing over here, this management thing, Chris Lighty, violator management. He goes, are you stupid? I, I'm like, Puff Daddy calling you stupid. And this time, this is P. Diddy. This is, this is the guy I don't like. There's five personalities, we'll get into that later, but P. Diddy's <laughs> the one I don't like. And P. Diddy calling me stupid, and I go, huh? He goes, you know retail? You know marketing, you know marketing endorsement deals, you know promotion, you go and learn management, there'll be no stopping you. And right there, he picks up the phone and calls Chris Lighty and says, I'm loaning you my number one guy. Okay, so me knowing Puff, 
he was ready for you to get out the building. Yeah, he was done. Like, he, was done. he was done. He was done. Puff <laughs> don't let no like Puff but, is like the 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 jealous girlfriend. If anybody is looking at you, he's like hell no. No, 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 no. But see, there's a difference there. Tell me. Sometimes you need a coach to show you where to go. He was preparing me to be his manager. So, so you think that's what it was? Of course. I'm going to Chris Lighty, the greatest manager in the game. Rest in peace, Chris. So, so, so let's 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 go from there, right? Uh -huh. This is your segue into management. Yes. Who Puffy, your, Puffy sent me to management. Puff sent you to management. Uh -huh. Who was your first major artist that you managed? Buster Rhymes. Okay, so now you're working under Chris Lighty. And for anybody who doesn't know Chris mm -hmm. Lighty, take a second and explain, because this <laughs> is a pivotal part of your story. Who's Chris Lighty? Chris Lighty was my mentor, my best friend, was my arch nemesis, was my enemy for life on site. Chris Lighty was the man who gave me the, I always say, born with Diddy, raised by Lighty. Born with Diddy's drive, can't stop, won't stop. That's in my DNA, that's in your DNA. That's why you're making these power moves. And raised by Lighty, but groomed in a certain way that everything was secondary. The artist's desires came first, whatever it took. Chris was a, Chris is a guide in my life. He's a light in my life. He comes to me in dreams. We talk. Chris was the ultimate entrepreneur. Chris was the ultimate manager. Chris was the ultimate friend. Chris was the ultimate chess player. i never forget, he'd be like, James, did you take the table? I'm like, what table? I'm supposed to take the table. He says, no, don't leave money on the table. Take the table, James, take the table. <laughs> and in that, negotiations became different. Let's get everything we can for the client. Chris was also a supporter of a, his whole family. He was also a father. But most importantly, he became my arch nemesis. Because we were so be best friends and so close, it came to a point where we had to really not like each other so that I could take the next step in my maturity as a manager. And a lot of people don't know, after all those years, Chris and I were getting back together right before he died. And um, maturity comes from a lot of different things. It's understanding oneself. It's understanding the people around you. It's dedication. It's commitment. It's persistence. It's integrity, and it's about knowing what's inside you and what your core values are. And a lot of times as managers, we need to go against our core values because we're performing a service. Chris knew how to balance that. He knew when he was told, when he advised somebody not to do something and they still wanted to do it, he knew how to separate himself from that decision. And he knew how to keep going on his own because he was walking his own path. So as a leader, as a role maker, as a model maker, Chris was, you know, I, I would say, and I'll say this into the camera, he was the best manager that ever lived. Rest in peace. So you were really trained by someone you admire but learned a lot from. Trained at gunpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Walk us through the artist roster that uh -huh. you came into Oof, man, at Violator was, Management. I walked in and it was Buster Rhymes, it was LL Cool J, it was Mob Deep, it was Noriega, it was Missy Elliott, um, and he was advising SRC and he was advising Fat Joe. And then Curtis walked in the room. Curtis meaning? 50 Cent Jackson. When Curtis walked into that building, we were at 825, um, it was something else. You see, the movement and the force that 50 came into the game with was something nobody could explain. We didn't have SoundCloud, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have none of that, we had no analytics. Our analytics was what was playing in the clubs and what was playing in everybody's cars. One day, Chris and I walked from our office on, on, on Park Avenue all the way over to look at his new office on 25th Street. And every freaking car that was driving down the street had 50 cent mixtape playing. That was our analytics. It was everybody vibing to him. It was going into the club and hearing the song at 140, 1230, and 240. That was our gauge. When we knew a record was playing, the record was hot, when it played at those times, it was like a, a, a force of nature. Chris had it all his experience. Remember, this is the man that was working with LL Cool J when LL Cool J did the Gap commercial, and he said, for us, by us, on the low, FUBU, in a Gap commercial, playing on every network across the world. Whoa. I had my experience with Sean, and it was like these two, perfect storm came together. And then, of course, you got to have the lawyer, Theo Sotomayor, you know, and then you had Marshall, and you had Dre. And it was like, you couldn't have asked for a better team. And in that time, it was Chris's vision of what a manager should be delivering for his client. 
my hard work, dedication, and gift the gab in those corporate meetings. Because remember, we had a Reebok deal too. We sold 3.8 million pairs of G unit sneakers. 3.8 million. We had street teams, we had van wraps, we had poster boards. We had everything that you would never even fathom selling a brand with, working and moving. We had a printer shop, we were printing money in the back. And it was just immense. But not only were we taking the money, we were reinvesting the money. Because don't get it twisted, that glassy out vitamin water deal, 50 invested his money into his own brand. He put his money where his mouth is. He bet on himself, and he won big on that. That was Chris and 50 working together. I did the deal, I did the promotions, the marketing, the street stuff, all those things that came together along with it, it was just a perfect storm. Theo negotiated deal, got the contracts right. We signed the contract at Summer Jam. I never wow. forget that. Wow. Yeah, we said at Summer Jam because it had to be in by that Monday morning and we were out on the road. We spent three years on the road. We wore bulletproof vests. I can't get into a lot of things, but we did a lot of things that weren't necessarily part of management. But we did it because of what we signed up for and we didn't complain about it. Were you 50's day to day at that time? I was, I was his day to day. I was his marketing guy. I, was, I had, ran street promotions, ran the marketing. We wrote the commercial. Jesse Torero and I would sit in a room What's the next video gonna look like? Okay, we're gonna make sure the sneaker's in it, we're gonna make sure the water's in it, we're gonna do this. Well, how do we write a, a commercial? Well, we're gonna put out this sneaker. Well, how's 50 gonna separate himself putting out the sneaker? Your budget's a million dollars to do TV commercials. All right, Jesse, he's Mr. T, I the tiger. We're gonna make sure we put him in a nasty ass gym, we work him out, we put vitamin water in there, but instead of spending all this money on, across TV networks, we're just gonna buy the BET Awards. We spent wow. that million dollars on the BET Awards. Every other commercial was um, 50 Cent and Reebok. Wow. And then after that is, how do you make a superhuman human again? You surround it with other superhuman beings. What was the breakup with you and Lighty? It was a lot of reasons, but if I have to really be extremely honest here, it was a lot of people who were very jealous of our friendship and relationship and how successful we were. Remember, there's a, very, a lot of turmoil, a lot of stuff going on between the, the beef with Irv and those guys, which by the way, Chris Gotti and I just traveled to Cuba together. Irv and I speak all the time. Um, and then it was also me, my head wasn't right. I think part of, my, um, part of my pain of not being able to deal with that quick success, just like some artists have as a manager, you know, there was a moment when Chris walked up to the club and said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Chris Lighty, I'm 50 Cent's manager. And the doorman said, no, you're not, James Cruz is, he's right there, and walked me right in. You know, it became almost, no, I, I was Chris's partner. If you look, executive management on the album, if you look, there was a lot of things that people didn't get, but Chris was molding me into something different. And then I was really bad. I was really drinking too much. I was partying too much. I was doing a lot of things that were going against, because I was going against my core values, I was covering them up and masking them with drugs and alcohol. You had an accelerated rise to the top yeah. of your industry. Um, what are we talking, all of 10 years at this point? If that, yeah. If, if that, that, correct? If that, yeah, we got 50 in 2001, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often to where someone comes in as an intern mm -hmm. and um, you know they're managing the hottest artists in the country mm -hmm. seven years later. At a very violent and tumultuous time, too. Absolutely. You know, and, um, you, know, you know, Puff was an intern. God bless him. You know, everybody knows that yeah, story. Everybody starts out. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that I really want people who follow this series to know. Humble yourself. There is nothing wrong with starting out at the bottom. At the bottom, you're no threat. That is the time you can learn. You can be a fly on the wall. That is the time that you can be in spaces because no one sees you as any threat to them. Well, you know, it's funny, and you know, nobody wanted to work the door at a Puff Daddy party. It was always a mess. Nobody wanted to be responsible for not letting the right people in or enough girls or nothing. I took that and embraced it. I'll work the door for you. You know why? Because I know I'm gonna say hi to Lior and I'm gonna say hi to this one and the hot new rapper that's coming, the hot new singer that's coming. I was gonna have FaceTime with them. And that was the bottom, nobody wanted that. But I look at life in a very simple way. If you go to a hospital and you're hooked up to the heart machine, what did you get? Beep, 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 Everything's up and down, up and down, up and down. If you're dead, what happens? Beep. Straight line. So in life, always accept your ups and downs because they're always gonna change. Life is always gonna be full of different changes. And we were on such a high rise, there was nowhere to go but down. But if you start from the bottom, there's nowhere to go from but up. 
Once you get up there, it's sustaining that that takes a lot of your precious time, your precious time and commitment in your heart and soul. Because after we were at the top, there was nowhere for me to go but the bottom. And I fell to rock bottom. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are a lot of people. I'm not ashamed of it. And anybody out there, if you have a friend, a colleague, a family member, a parent, a, a child that has certain dependency issues, don't oh. look at that as a problem. Look at that as a solution because they're dealing with a traumatic experience that they weren't prepared or didn't have the tools to deal with. That's a part of this conversation mm -hmm. that, I, that we're definitely going to get to. Okay, okay. And I just, you know, I'm I want to fast forward to how did you get back? Now, you're on top of the world. Mm -hmm. So I think I know the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. You working with some of the biggest artists in music, mm -hmm. Missy Elliott, um, Busta, Busta Rhymes, Rhymes. <laughs> you know, 50 Cent. Uh -huh. How do you get back with Puff? You know, it's funny. So Puff signed the deal with the firm. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. I and never the firm, by the way, is a man it was a management, management company. Mm -hmm. And um, I sent Puff, a, a, we had the clamshell Scott Tells, and I sent him, I said, yo, you signed with the firm, huh? He said, yeah, man. I go, why don't you give me a shot? And in all honesty, he said, if you were alone, you could have had one. And I said, I don't do anything alone. I do everything with Chris. And um, he, was, he was actually really, he was really, I don't know if it was impressed or it was re he really embraced the fact that I said, I do everything with Chris. And um, Puff was going out on tour and he was going out on the Puff Puff Pass tour with Snoop. And we went to <laughs> Europe and, um, you know, he, he gave us a shot. And uh, Chris went out for the first two days and then disappeared. And uh, <laughs> I stayed out for two weeks and uh, well, actually it was three weeks, almost a month. And, um, you know, it, we, we, our friendship Puff and I, our friendship started to, to gel. Our understanding of one another, you know, and uh, I had, it was funny, I tell a, a funny story, but I had just done the same tour uh, a, a month and a half before with Busta, and then three months before with 50. So I was getting upgraded in every hotel room that I would get. I would get the presidential suite. They said, Mr. Cruz, you're here again. You know, all the money you spend, they're gonna upgrade you. And uh, Uncle Paulie came to my room one time, knocked on the door. Uncle Paulie? Uh, his security guard. Okay, Puff security. Puff security. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and opens the door, he says, wow, look at your room. And um, five minutes later, Puff came to my door. What's up with that room, yo? What you doing? I need that. And I'm like, oh, man. So I had to give him my room. <laughs> but it's OK, because the artist always comes first. And that's part of that ego that starts to build up when you're at the top. You got to humble that ego. You got to keep that ego at bay, because that ego can just fall into place just like with an artist. So I gave up my room to Puff. And you know, he took the room for the rest of the tour. He was in the biggest room. Um, but we also understood that, hey, I took a step back. And I was still in the, in the place of 50, you know? Because that was a service, and that was the first height that I had ever felt. But Sean's my friend and my brother. We were there, Chris, my wife and I were there when Christian was born. You know, we raised Justin. So there's a difference between performing a service and being part of a family. And that's when you felt family. Question for you, and this is more personal. Mm -hmm. A personal trait of yours, what would you say is your greatest personal trait that has helped you in the area of management? Personal trait? Doing whatever it takes, good or bad, being able to put my ego and put my core values aside because I'm delivering a service, go to bed after, wake up before. Um, the artist. Um, and then, you know, if I didn't have my wife and my children, that balance, that balance is so important. To be able to go home and just be daddy. To be able to just go home and just be James. Because just as an artist creates this person, just as, like I said, Puff Daddy. You got Puff Daddy, you got Puffy, you got P. Diddy, you got Sean, and you got Diddy. Okay? Starts with Sean, then it goes to Puff. I love Sean, I love Puff. Then it goes to P. Diddy. He, I don't want to even be in the same room with that man. <laughs> then it goes to Diddy. And, you know, in understanding those different personalities, you create your own personality. And sometimes it's good to go home and just be you. Because you tend to forget when you're doing all these things for other people who you truly are. And your wife and your kids and your family members and your brothers and your sisters will remind you. Hey, I remember you. You're not James. My nickname is Dundi. A lot of people know that. I was born in June. I was my mother's joy. But, you know, we grew up in the hood in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. So it became Junji because they always give you a nickname. And then we're Puerto Rican, so we can't pronounce the letter J. So it became Dundi. <laughs> and when I go home and I just could be Dundi, that's who I truly am. 
So in all your travels, never forget who you are, because it's very easy with success to forget what your core values really mean to you and who you truly are. Always have that. I keep talking about my angel. I keep talking about this spirit that, 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 that walks with me, that talks to me, that keeps me in line. And you know, I got, you got the devil on one hand and you got the angel on the other. That's real. You go either way. It's your decision to make. But always remember who you are and who you want to be as you're building that facade of how you want others to see you in business. Because I don't believe that they're wrong in that. You can't just be yourself in business all the time because you have to perform a service to somebody else. And if you're performing a service to somebody else, you have to be who they are and how they would act in a situation. What's your worst personal trait and how did you adjust it in the area of business? Because there's so many people who are watching this, who admire you, who know your story, mm -hmm. but we're not perfect. You know, what would you say is your worst personal trait and how have you adjusted it in the world of business? Addictive personality. When you talk about putting your head down and working hard, you know, you're addicted to your job. You're addicted to, your, to, to, to performing your service. You're addicted to being successful. You're addicted to looking good. You're addicted to all these things. And then there's other addictions that happen. And those addictions are the ones, those demons that you have to fight because you're covering up a lot of different things. And I've been blessed to be given the opportunity. I've been given more chances than they say, a cat has nine lives, well, Cruz has got 29 lives. And I have to be thankful for that. But that only happens when the universe is giving you back for being a good soul, for being sincere. So how, did, how, how have you adjusted it? Or did you need to adjust it? I needed it to go to away. I needed, I needed to go away. I needed to go do 30 days. I needed to go sit down for a second. Sometimes, you know, I look at it, if you look at that height, I say, wow, you did it so fast and you did it all so much. That light switch was on for those 25 years. That light switch did not come off. There was no rest, there was no relaxation, there was no spiritual grounding. That light was just on, you just going, 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 going. Eventually you're gonna hit a brick wall. Eventually you're gonna wake up one day and be like, what the fuck is going on? And I hit that brick wall. And that brick wall came at what I would like to say probably one of the greatest achievements of my career in putting together the Bad Boy and the Family Tour, the anniversary, you know, it was, there were very few individuals who believed that would ever happen. And Puff has it, and I have the video, and Puff says it, he said the one person that he could not have done it without was me. That could go both ways. That could go as a vote of courage and start celebrating, or that could go as, God damn, but I'm not being compensated for what I feel I deserve in that. And I don't mean financially, I mean in credit. Ego again, controlling that ego, controlling that demon. And because of that, I had to go take a break and sit down and really reevaluate Am I a good man? I'm going against these core values. Am I a good husband? Am I a good father? Am I a good son? Am I a good child of God? And that has, you have to reevaluate things and come, come to Jesus in a mirror and say, hey, made some mistakes, you did some great things too, but where do you go from here? And that's learning and, re and managing yourself because we're constantly giving and pouring, pouring and pouring. You can't pour from an empty cup no more. You got nothing left for you. And that took a moment to take a step back and say, hey, it's okay. And in going away and working with kids that have childhood turmoils, that they don't have the skills to deal with, that grow into negativity in their future lives, to find individuals who lost parents, lost loved ones, lost certain things in their life that they thought they couldn't live without, and masking that pain. And, uh, Excuse me, I get emotional about it because I understand I'm not the only one. You know? Mental illness is a big deal in the music business. A lot of people don't address it. Talk about Lighty killing himself. Up for public opinion. Talk about President Def Jam killing himself. Talk about a lot of individuals who are masking who they truly are because they don't have the tools. Sometimes you need to get coached. Michael Jordan is great, but he needed Phil to become the best Jordan he could. Mike Tyson, I love Mike, say from Brooklyn, just like me, said Brownsville, Brooklyn, but he needed cuss. Sometimes you need somebody to coach you, but you gotta be willing to be mentored. You gotta be willing to listen. You gotta be willing to change your ways for the benefit of yourself. And that's not being selfish, because once you're good, the people around you start to get better. The people around you start to feel that positive energy and say, whoa, wait a, wait a minute, he's different. He's special, something different about him. Hope he stays that way because with that, there also is relapse. That's a part of recovery. 
And that's nothing to be ashamed of. But when individuals push you towards that relapse, when people know you're not using, you're not drinking, and offer you something, do you consider them friends? I consider them angels. Because they're testing you. Because if you don't know how far you can, you can't, you can't know where you're going unless you push yourself to that edge. You can't know where you're going unless you push yourself so hard that you got no more left. I listen to these inspirational messages every time I go to the gym or when I have a chance at home or when I'm driving. And you got to be a stakeholder in your life. You've got to know who you are. Are you a starter? Are you a finisher? You know, do you start and don't finish? You have to take ownership of who you are. So as you're judging everybody else and he's this and you're that, well, look at yourself. Because as you judge other individuals, you're just pro pro projecting who you truly are onto them so that you don't have to deal with your inner work. I've dealt with my inner work. My wife, God bless her soul, she's an angel, she's a saint. She's dealt with my inner work. My kids have dealt with my inner work. But everybody here, as if you could take one thing away, deal with your inner work. Because that's going to be the most important part of your growth. Because you're not going to achieve your blessings until you're ready. I complain all the time to my wife, I'm blocked, I'm blocked. This is not happening, that's not happening. Well, because I wasn't right. I'll tell you one thing, the breakup with me and Lighty was over aqua, uh, vitamin water. I didn't get what I deserved out of the deal. At least I thought that. But then after 2020 hindsight, if I'd have got what I thought I got out of the deal, I might be in the grave, in jail. It wasn't time. I was protected from that. Thank God. And I held a lot of animosity towards him for a long time. And at my 40th birthday, when he came and he says, it's time to put Batman and Robin together. I said, yeah, but this time I'm Batman and you're <laughs> Robin. And he laughed. And there's a beautiful photo of us. And we were getting back together. And we lost him about a month and a half later. Rest in peace. And my mom said the best thing in the world she could ever say to me, because I was heartbroken about it. She said, that was his soul making amends to you. So I don't know what anybody's spiritual beliefs are. I'm not trying to uh, preach them. But there is a higher power out there. There is something else out there that's inside all of us. Each and every one of us has it inside us. Each and every one of us has the ability and the right to shine no matter what. Don't dim your light because somebody else is, is shining in their eyes. As children of, a, a, of God or as the universe, however you want to say it, spiritual energies, you all have the ability and the right to shine. And don't let anybody tell you any otherwise because that's, that's a lie. I think it's so poignant what you're saying, but I really need to bring to the surface that no, you're speaking about extremely successful individuals, including yourself. Mm -hmm. And from the outside looking in, it's easy to look at these people as superhuman, mm -hmm. but they're just men and women. They put on their pants one leg at a time and they deal with the same struggles as everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's just how you deal with them. And it's also heightened when you're in the public persona. No, absolutely. But you know, but like big looking the for, for, at a person like yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Most people on the outside looking in would not know that you struggle with addiction. Right. They wouldn't know the pain. All they see James Cruz hanging with stars, right. managing stars. Mm -hmm. James Cruz. His life is great. <laughs> yeah, but, but <laughs> I, I just want to take a second to shine your humanness on it because I think it's important for people who are coming up and want to be successful. You have what it takes to become successful. Every single one of you. You're very human, just like everybody mm -hmm. else is. And um, I think, you know, and I, and I really want to congratulate you for allowing you know, yourself to be so vulnerable and sharing with our audience. Well, it wouldn't happen with anybody else, Sean. <laughs> but, you know, I think it, it's time, in, in all fairness, people don't see Ali in the gym for eight months before he goes out for that heavyweight fight. People don't see Michael Jordan taking a thousand jump shots. You know, everybody has the same 24 hours, the same seven days. It's how you utilize those 24 hours, seven days. You got to work on your weaknesses. Everybody knows your strengths. You got to work out in the gym and keep getting stronger, but you also got to acknowledge and work on your weaknesses. And a lot of people don't like to look at their weaknesses. <clears throat> and everybody has a weakness. Everybody has a strength. Everybody has a gift. But if you look at your weaknesses and start to work on them, you're going to be in a stronger place. If you start putting analytics to yourself, okay, am I, am I a starter? Am I a finisher? Am, am, am I on special teams? Am I on defense? If you know who and what you are, Allen Iverson ain't playing center. 
And Shaquille definitely ain't playing point guard. So if you know what your role is and you define that role and you do it to your best, you know, there's a saying in the Bible, it's part of one of my inspirational quotes, is that see a man who is focused with intent on doing the best work he can, you will see him in front of kings. And these, I walk with giants. I've walked with some of the biggest giants in the game. I probably managed everybody in the game at some point in their career, except for Jay-Z and Kanye. And those are, I'm too, I'm Jay's biggest fan. Brooklyn can't say nothing to me about Brooklyn and see what he's done in business. But you have to look at the perspective of, I know I was worth it and I was ready to lead a king because the kings also need their stable. They need the people to manage them, need the people to show them the right way, to give them insight. The king makes the final decision. But you're your king of yourself. And your decisions that you make in life are going to be what takes you to success or what takes you to demise, whatever those decisions are. And no judgmental on anybody. My decisions were leading me down the wrong path. However, my soul and my sincerity and my heart gave me the opportunity to be with individuals that supported me and helped me out, like Steve Rifkin, like Puff Daddy, like Lee Marie Cruz, who's a giant in and of herself, even Prez. I can tell you, uh, share a, a sincere story. A couple uh, months ago, I was really down on something because something didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And for one minute, I let that ego creep in again. And I called Prez up and I had a conversation with him. And just his inspirational talk, and how he was addressing it and how he compared it to his own situation made me say, wait a minute, man, what am I doing again? Because sometimes you need a refresher course. Sometimes you need to be reminded. You know what I mean? Because you can get, start, start feeling sorry for yourself, but then you realize that, hey, everything's happening for a reason. It's all good. And Sean, thank you for that. But had it not been for that talk, I probably wouldn't have realized how mature he became. And in this process, and doing this here, and the next one that he's going to do, and the last one that he did, and I was like, well, wait a minute. He helped me at a moment. Let me see if I can give that and pass that, pay, pay that forward, I should say, and pass that on to you guys. You bring up... Lee Marie, uh -huh. as long as I've known you, <laughs> I've known her. <laughs> you and her are thick as thieves. Uh -huh. You are also a man of access. Mm -hmm. You are a man of means. And Lee, I'm not sure where you're at in the room, but She's congratulations <laughs> on 22 years of marriage. You guys just Deuces. celebrated. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is the epitome of ride or, or die. die. I wish she was on the stage so I can <laughs> ask her this question, but I'll ask you. <laughs> how the hell did you guys keep it together for all of these years and you still walk and talk like best friends? It's 99.9999% or her. I cannot sit here and take credit. I'm not proud to admit a lot of my transgressions. I'm not, allowed to, I'm not proud to admit a lot of my past failures. What I am proud to say is that we've almost said deuces a lot of times. We almost broke up and, and let it go. But in 22 years, we've stayed together. And that has to do with two things, true love, dedication. So somebody used to tell me, if you had advice for somebody when they're getting married, what would it be? And the advice was always be a little deaf and be a little blind. They say Lee Marie is called Helen Keller. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> but when things are just meant to be, they're just meant to be. Marriage, isn't, is, is, marriage is tough, it's dedication, it's hard work, it's, it's loyalty, it's, it, it's problems, it's ups and downs. It's that heartbeat that I was telling you about. You know, there's no steady rise, there's no steady flat line. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. And you gotta make a decision. I'm blessed because I found they don't make her like that anymore. Like, they don't, you know, they, I got friends that tell me she's cut from a different cloth. She is, you know what I'm saying? I think it was part of G, the, what wrapped Jesus up when he died. That's a cloth they made her from. <laughs> but, you know, I appreciate that. And without her, there'd be no me. But not a lot of people are willing to say that or admit that in public. There would be no me. There would be no James Cruz. I would just be Dundi. And she's made the commitments, the sacrifices. She's made everything possible, not just for me, but for our children and for my mother and for her mother and for the family. She's a glue that keeps it together. 
When you find something good, don't let it go. No matter what it is. And trust me, I've tried. It's like you ever get that stick, you go like this, try to get it off your hand, and she won't go. You know? And that's not me, that's somebody else. I keep talking about this spiritual power that's keeping me in line. That's our spiritual power. For that, I thank God every day. So thank you, Lee. I love you. Congratulations. <laughs> Juices. <laughs> I'm sweating now, see? Fred, put me under pressure. <laughs> Got a couple of quick questions yeah. for you. Um, you have children, correct? Mm -hmm. Two. Alexis and Isabella. No one is supposed to admit, you know, as parents, you can't ask who's your favorite child. Uh -huh. But anybody who has multiple children uh -huh. has a, a favorite child. Uh -huh. You've managed a ton of artists. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite? I don't want to call him a child, but who's your favorite artist? It's easy, Puff. Really? Yeah. The most difficult, incorrigible, out of control. Puff could have been Steve Jobs. I mean, this guy is an absolute genius. Challenges you in the middle of the storm, which is where I live. In the middle of the storm. <laughs> That's where I live. It's like a tornado. And I'm right there like this. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Everybody, I right, cows flying around and shit. But in the middle of the storm, Puff made, brought out the best in you. Puff brought out whatever you have. It's like, you know, I remember one time, and I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but everybody see the movie Any Given Sunday with Jamie Foxx? You know that was supposed to be Puff. Puff was supposed to play the quarterback. And, the Jamie um, Foxx role was supposed to be yeah. Puff. And... Puff just couldn't focus on the role and it didn't work out for him. And I remember one night we were in the office and we were writing a marketing plan for, um, for Forever. And Puff walked in and he made all the executives sit there and he handed out this piece of paper and it was a, it was a speech from Vince Lombardi. Winning is not a sometimes thing, it's an all the time thing. You don't do things right some of the time, you do them right all the time. Winning becomes a habit. Those lines are so important that I have it sitting in my office at home, I had a city in my office at Badway, I had a city in my office at SRC. That speech from Vince Lombardi was so, because at the end of that speech, it starts to talk about, I don't know a man worth his weight in gold in favor that lies on the, uh, lies on the field of battle victorious. Puff made you want to go, can't stop, won't stop, wasn't just a saying, it was real. Can't stop, won't stop. It's in our DNA. I got chills as I'm saying it. Puff, in a close second, Buster Rhymes. Because a lot of people, you, you, bus, like, let me explain to you, the, this is a global icon, you know? Yo, James, I'm not understanding why the poster boys, man, fuck the poster boys, man, we going, you know, but Buster would challenge you too in a different way. But Buster was, you would catch him in every club. He would be riding around the flyest whips. He was all over the place, but he was almost like a cartoon character. I met Buster Rhymes before I even got, I met Buster Rhymes when I was hurt in Brooklyn. He came and performed with leaders of the new school at some roller rink. And it was God's plan to say, you guys are meant to be together. Question for you. Who's the most fun artist you ever worked with? Most fun? Yeah. Missy Elliott. Missy, Missy Elliott. Elliott. Missy Elliott. Most I didn't fun expect artist. that. Missy Elliott. Most fun artist ever. Most fun. She had jokes, cracking jokes, you know, saying things like, you know, playing, playing the dozens. You know, she's from South. She's from VA. Missy was so much fun because Missy was just, it, 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 and you couldn't take it serious. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, she's just an amazing person. Tell me something about Missy Elliott, uh -huh. 50 Cent, and Puff uh -huh. that we can't read in a book. They're all the same person. What does that mean? Elaborate. They're all the same person when it comes to their careers and their commitment to their careers. Puff is can't stop, won't stop. 50 is get rich or die trying. Missy Elliott is, you know, is, is Miss E. Like her music, like these guys is drive. It just doesn't stop. It's like what you consider successful, they don't understand the word successful. They keep going. There's more, there's more, there's more. There's something else to do, there's something else to do. You know, the one thing, if I separate them all, Missy is, is, is doesn't like being in public. She is such a genius that it's like she has to be in her, her, her studio mode. Fifth, Fifth is a genius. Yeah, you can talk about the manipulation. Yeah, you can talk about the, the, the bully stuff that everybody wants to talk about. But he is entertainment right in front of you. I'm sure everybody follows him on Instagram. He's hilarious. This guy is... is hilarious to me. He's smart. He's aggressive. He is probably, in my opinion, he's, he's one of one. You'll never find another 50. Puff? Now that man, you'll never see this in a book. 
Puff is the greatest son, greatest father, and greatest friend someone could ever have. Not a lot of people know that about Sean Combs. Not a lot of people know how many times he's given of himself to help others. How many jobs he's created, how many opportunities he's created, how much social influence that man has had. No one in this world would ever be able to gauge those analytics because they're just so far gone. Sean has done more for individuals than a lot of people. Sean has also created more opportunities for a lot of people. Sean has shown us where we come from, how we can be the best that we can be. Sean has given us inspiration. Sean has given us pain, missing you, oh to big. Sean has given us structure on how to run our businesses. Sean has given us opportunities to do things in businesses that we never thought of, Ciroc, Revolt. Sean has also given us, and I like to say it this way, understanding that all of these successful, wonderful geniuses all come from one place. Hard work, dedication, not giving up, belief in oneself. Four simple rules. And sticking by those rules was made Sean Sean. Although he's a genius, he hears things differently. Like the way we hear music, he hears it a whole nother way. Complete other way. And he's also a genius. Anybody in this room know the, the song Victory? Yeah. My three favorite artists of all time. Sean Combs, Busta Rhymes, B.I.G. How about the time we had to pull back every piece of vinyl out because, remember that? I'm going to take you back, Sean. You don't remember? I don't know what you're about to say. Go ahead. We had to pull every piece of vinyl back from the DJs that we serviced. We did that multiple times. No, though. no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. The one time we really did it, full servicing, not the short list, not the 150 list. Okay. Which which time was that? You don't remember? Who, what do you think it was? I know. What? It's uh, blow up like the world train. Nope. The Nas train. Nope. You don't remember, Eddie? Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Enlighten us. Well, I don't know if we can say it in front of the public, but remember there were two bars at the end of the song. I'm barred. Jehovah barred me from the pearly gates. Fuck them. I didn't want to go to heaven anyway. Okay. Yes, I do remember that. Remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. And you can say that in front of the public. Okay. What you just said. <laughs> <laughs> but do you remember? Do you remember? Yes, I do. Very, very but much so. Do you remember so. how he drove us? that we didn't leave a stone unturned, that we returned with every single piece of vinyl. Now it's a negative turned into a positive. You know, and, and it's interesting because I want to keep the, the interview centered yeah, yeah, on yeah, you yeah. because we can talk about Sean Combs all night. I, I, I think that he has had a profound um, impact on your life, my life. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, so many of ours, Lee Marie's. <laughs> um, but for you, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I should have asked you this earlier mm -hmm. when you were, were speaking um, how Allen Iverson, mm -hmm. you know, he wanted people who walk like him, talk like mm -hmm. him. James Cruz, this guy, you know, dapper, well-dressed. Mm -hmm. You have been either in the room or spearheading so many deals over mm -hmm. the course of your career. Explain to the audience the importance of being, and, and Puff used to call it switching gears. Yes, switching gears. Meaning, you got to be able to talk both languages. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to talk that street talk. But when you go into the boardroom, you need to suit up mm -hmm. and speak a different language. How have you been able to do that, switch gears in your career, and how has it helped you? Well, you know, it, coming out of management, and, and really identify what it is that I want to do for my future was, was a moment where I was with Rifkin. And I thought marketing was my thing between the vitamin water deal, the Reebok deal, this deal, that deal. It was just like, okay, well, let me sit back and do these deals. And there's this guy named Steve Stout. He called me the Puerto Rican Steve Stout. Steve Stout could walk, talk that talk in the street, talk that talk in the boardroom. But the one thing he couldn't talk was that Spanish that I got. I speak three languages. And that was the beauty of it. And that's where things started to transition because we've created this template in hip hop and created this hip hop culture. Now all we have to do is call, call a couple of audibles and position that in the Latin space. 
Why can't Bad Bunny have a diamond supply or a clothing line? Why can't Maluma be the face of H&M and replace David Beckham because they have the same style and look? Why can't we see these Latin stars? We, you know, look at Super Bowl this year. J-Lo, Shakira, Pitbull. You know, 60% of the United States is going to be Latin in, in the next 50 years. So if you start to really realize corporate America is going to attack that zone. But are they going to attack it for integrity and build the culture? Or are they just going to attack it for a financial gain? We need to learn from our past. Remember Vote or Die? When Puff put that out, now we need to identify, okay, how are we going to position our future stars to be those social influencers? I don't want to see, God forgive me, Beyonce and Jay-Z hanging out with Obama or hanging out with Hillary the night before an election. I want to see some consistency and something that's going on to help our community and help our youth and help people understand that, you know what, we do have power. We have power in our vote. We have power in our voice. We have power in our struggle if we do this together and identify that. So in that, speaking that third language is what separates me from everybody else. But in speaking those marketing terms, because I tell you one thing, management, people say management is a thankless job. Mona Scott used to always say, it's a thankless job, James. Don't expect thanks. Just expect your check in the mail. No, I expect the wire in the bank. Lydie used to say, take the table. He's like, what's your favorite noise? And I used to say, oh, you know, a baby, a baby crying or the money machine. <laughs> Lydie used to say, well, my favorite, my favorite sound is beep, 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 when they're backing up the Brinks truck to my house. You know, and, and those, are, those drove us, you know. Books like The 48 Laws of Power, Never Outshine the Master, Use the Mirror Tactic. You know, that's where we come from. It was a very battle time. But having an arsenal of weapons was great because everybody had the same arsenal. The only thing is I just had this nuclear bomb that was Puerto Rican and spoke Spanish. And I used to bug out. We used to go to Mix Show Power Summit. Eddie, you, we used to go to Mix Show Power Summit. Angie Martinez didn't speak Spanish. DJ Enough didn't speak Spanish. We were in Puerto Rico all the time. I had to speak Spanish at all these events because I was the only executive that spoke Spanish. So it was almost like, wait, wait a minute. I've got something special here. So identify what your special talent is that you have. Identify what it is that you have that nobody else can do. That's what's going to separate you from the crowd. But that's also going to make you you and people identify that. Because like I said early on, I don't know if you caught it, I was too white to be black and I was too black to be white. I was down the middle. And I used that to my benefit. I used it to my benefit, not in a negative way, but I was just cool with everybody. It wasn't a race thing for me. I'll never forget the day the O.J. Simpson trial, you had all the black executives and staff in one office and all the white executives and staff in another office. That's how separated we were back then. You don't see that anymore. You see young Latinos working. You see young African-Americans working. You see Asians. It's hip hop, man. It ain't black. It ain't white. It ain't Asian. It ain't purple. It ain't polka dot. It ain't pink. It's fucking hip hop. And that's what we built, this culture. And that's what I can say I'm so proud of. Not any specific artist, not any specific deal. But just being able to say, man, look what we did with no education, with no blueprint, with no money. Look what we were able to do. Hip hop is the number one force in the globe right now. I'm seeing French Montana position himself as a cultural icon, immigrant, hip hop Muslim. I'm applauding that. I'm watching Cardi B, funny as shit. Used to work the pole, dance for dollars. Being a stripper wasn't cool. You hit it. Look, look where she's at. I'm watching artists revive themselves like Little Kim and reestablish themselves with new music. I'm seeing, wow, this is a beautiful thing called hip hop, and we built it. And when I say we, I say all of us. I can't take credit, but I was, I was there, a part of the culture. And that's where I say, well, now we can speak Spanish and do the same shit in the Latin world. But. It's also a different cultural approach. We came from a certain culture. Understanding the culture is going to be the key. Got a few more questions sure, for yeah, you. Sure, yeah, man, we got all night. Lee, we ain't got nothing to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you speak a lot but, um, about the different areas of your life. Mm -hmm. And in just wrapping the, um, the interview, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. Mm -hmm. One is about reinvention. Mm -hmm. Why has reinvention been important to you in, in your career? And how have you used it to your benefit to help further your career? Well, reinvention is key. Because if you look at certain, certain executives that lasted 10 years in a, in a role, and then they weren't needed anymore. And they worked themselves right out of the game. 
So from a marketer to a, from, 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 from a retail marketer to a manager to a marketer back to a manager, you know, to really living in this cultural space. You know, what a lot of people don't know about me is I, the entertainment agency of record for Brand Jordan for the last 15 years. But I worked at Reebok. I went from a blood to a crib. <laughs> as they say, you know, because I did such a great job at Reebok and was able to do so many things, Brand Jordan brought me over to do all their stuff uh, when it comes to entertainment side. And that was something a lot of people didn't know. They just saw James always had the freshest sneakers, always get you to fly. No, I was an original sneakerhead. But I reinvented a style and an approach to business, whether it was a spirit like a mezcal or whether it was a vodka or, you know, whether, or whether it was selling sneakers or it was selling clothes. Or whether it was just coming from a different perspective and reinventing myself from my dress. I was thinking, what am I going to wear? I called Press, yo, what are you wearing? He's like, t-shirt and jeans. I was like, well, you know what? You got to look the part. But I would have been right here in, in, a, in a sweatsuit with some Yeezys on chilling. However, would you take me more seriously if I was dressed like this? I believe so. I believe perception is reality in this game. And not a lot of people accept that term. Perception is not reality. Perception is your reality, not mine. So if I come dressed like this, I'll be more approachable to the faculty and to the staff. If I come dressed in a sweatsuit, there's just this thing about that. I don't believe it because I don't, I don't care. Listen, I watch guys dressed like this working for the guy in a sweatsuit because he owns the app or owns the plane or owns whatever. It's changing. However, the reinventing side has to be done when you're ready and wanting to do it. It has to be a desire to. I see Steve Rifkin all the time, sweatpants, t-shirt, and, and sneakers on. Steve Rifkin, it's a cultural icon. But Puff, you might see him in, uh, with the do-rag and the hoodie on on Instagram, and then he's wearing the hottest fashion coming straight off the runway in France. Looking the part and dressing for the day. Knowing where you're going after that day and what message you want to send without having to say anything is what you set your clothes on. And that's about reinvention. Now, as far as business reinvention, I'm blessed to be able to say, what do I want to do this morning? I'm blessed to be able to say, hey, babe, it's our 22nd year anniversary. You want to go to London and Paris for the weekend? That was a gift. Because I've created such great relationships that somebody felt that they should give that to us because of all we've done for others. Reinventing myself as a sober individual, which I have battles with every day. Reinventing myself as a, like you say, marketing guru. I don't see myself as a marketing guru. I see myself as somebody who just, would I buy that? If the true definition of power is being able to influence the decision-making process of another, then the true definition of marketing is being able to influence their emotional state. Being able to influence their emotional state, a spontaneous buy. When you walk into a supermarket and you're paying at the, catch or at the register and there's a bunch of stuff on the side, you're like, let me get that, let me get this, the impulse. Oh man, I don't like that. That's whack. They did this corny ass commercial. Oh, I want to try that stupid ass veggie burger that they got at Burger King because what? it's being able to influence your emotional state. It's a composer. If you look at my bio, I'm a cultural composer because I'm composing a story for you. I'm composing a story to make you hear what you want to hear, whether it's the violin, whether it's the drum, whether it's the, whatever it is, I'm composing a story to make you hear something to make you spend. Now, you don't have to spend just financially. You can just spend your time paying attention to it or talking about it. Word of mouth, Showtime Boxing, doing the marketing for Showtime Boxing. Manny Pacquiao versus Floyd Mayweather was the biggest coup in the world. We knew Floyd was going to whoop him, okay? Conor McGregor, are you serious? $80,000 a ticket, it was hype, it was promotion, man. It was Don King all over again. That was marketing. That's how I influence your emotional state. You have to buy this, this $109.99 pay-per-view when every other pay-per-view was $69.99. Which you had, you couldn't miss it. You had to be a part. You gotta get those Jordans when they come out. You gotta get those Yeezys when they come out. You gotta have it. It's, you know, part of that is being conditioned, influencing your emotional state. When you're listening to SoundCloud, or you're listening to one of these streaming services and the algorithm is telling me, okay, let me play you all this other music because you're gonna like it. We're preconditioned. How many of us grew up cleaning the house on Saturday morning, making sure mom was playing music? And mom was playing all kinds of music. I remember my mother was playing Donna Summer, Celia Cruz. She was playing hip hop, you know? Growing up with those influences start to take your mind somewhere. And I know how to use those messages to make sure you spend on what it is I'm trying to give you, whether it's music, whether it's clothing, whether it's, whether it's a message. 
What's the best advice you ever received? Headex time. He said, James, you're a very passionate individual. If you learn how to corral that passion and point in the right direction, you'll be unstoppable. Discipline was the message. Discipline. If you can discipline yourself and know what you want and take all your energy and put it towards that, without any distractions, without any noise, without any static, you will make your dream come true. It's the worst advice you ever received. Don't get married. Just live with her for a while. <laughs> you know where that came from. <laughs> um, the worst advice I ever received? Irv Gotti. Don't manage that dude. It's no good. Now I'm assuming we're talking about 50 Cent. Yeah. <laughs> but it came from his heart. At that time, it came from his heart, so I understood it. I don't hold it against him. Because he knew you're only as strong as your chain. If you have a weak link in that chain, he knew I had a strong link. He knew I wasn't going nowhere. What advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> a lot of it. Um, top three things, though. One, follow your gut. Trust your gut. Two, you don't need that in your system. Three, don't lose what you got because you're going to miss what you got when you don't have it anymore. So appreciate what you have. However little it may be, or however much it may be, appreciate it. Everything appreciated. Final question for you. Mm -hmm. At what point, past or present, did you say to yourself, I made it. I did good. At what was the scenario I never, that you had I've ever never, dreamed of? I've no, never said that to myself. No, I, I, I get it. I, I get that there's no finish line. But we all have a moment in our careers mm -hmm. where we're sitting across the table from someone we admire, mm -hmm. where we're in a room mm -hmm. with people who we never thought we'd meet. Mm -hmm. And we're, you got to pinch yourself and just say, holy smoke, I made it. My hard work is paying off. You know, and you've I, had there's many two, a moment. There's two answers to that question, though, because I'll never forget, I'll never forget one night when Puff took Jennifer to, to the MTV Awards and we were invited to an after party. And I'm sitting there and, and Puff is sitting on my left and Leah's on my right and Jennifer's there and Jennifer's mom and there's Joe Pesci and there's Will Smith and, and there's Jada Pinkett Smith and Mark Anthony walks in there, which is a whole other conversation. Um, and, then, um, and then Ricky Martin comes walking up the stairs and my wife has a meltdown because she's a big Manudo fan and Puff is like grabbing my hand under the chair, like calm her down and Jennifer's cracking up. And I had to sit back and I was like, I belong here. I belong here. I might be from the 17th floor of the projects, but I'm just as comfortable here as I am on the 17th floor of the projects. But then there was another time when um, I used to have this crazy dream and I used, to see, I used to see this house up on a hill with the white truck parked in front of it. I used to always see this damn house. And one time, um, my wife and I are talking, and she's like, they're selling this house over here. And she sends me a picture. And it was the house. I swear to God, on everything I love, it was the house that I saw in my dreams. With the white truck parked in front. I drive a white Cadillac, by the way. And it was like, wait a minute. That's the house. And the day we closed, and I said, this is it. And I wasn't surrounded by any superstars. I wasn't surrounded by any billionaires. I was surrounded by my wife, my two daughters, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. And at that moment, I said, wow. Wow. This is what it all comes to. Look what we did. And I didn't say, I, I did. Look what we did. And then that day, I got into my Mercedes Benz. <laughs> <laughs> and I put on a white t-shirt and a Yankee cap and I drove around the neighborhood blasting Tupac with the, with the windows down to see what was going to happen. 
Said, we're in Clark, New Jersey, and they say they spell Clark with three K's, if you know what I mean. <laughs> right? And I drive through the neighborhood, nothing happens. Go home, my wife, she got her Benz truck, driving around, got my daughters in the back seat. As soon as we pull out, make a left, whoop, 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 whoop. Both guys, guns out, the whole shit. Am I lying? Okay, a couple weeks later. <laughs> You're right. And, oh, we stopped you because you, your registration is, is done. And expired. Expired. And um, I'm like, huh? This is a 2014 truck. It's 2014. What are you talking about? It's expired. It's a brand new truck. And they followed us back home. And I live in a cul-de-sac on a lake. And um, went around, parked, drove off. And that's when I realized, don't matter nothing. You're still who you are. You're still who you are to them. You may have been around the world seven times, and I've been around the world seven times, thank God. I've met billionaires, kings, queens. I've met princes, sultans, you name it. It's never changed me. And I'm never going to change them. And when I came home, I had to realize I'm still the kid from the 17th floor of the projects with the handicapped mother, with the hustler homeboys, with the superstar friends, with the wife and two kids, with the mafioso homeboys that you grew up with. It doesn't change, I'm still Dundi. And to bring it all back together, I'm still Dundi and I'll always be Dundi. But James Cruz, that's a special character. And anything you can learn from him is great. But you can learn more from Dundee than you could ever from James Cruz about life. And that's why I like to, I like to listen to people talk about life. I like to listen to the old men. I like to hear the old Italian guys sitting down telling me their stories. I like to hear that. Because um, I, I used to, there's another, another term that I got. Any person, well, it's really a man, but any person that wants to build their own philosophy in life has to pick and choose from the philosophy of others and then make their own decision on what they keep and what they throw away. We'll end it there. Mm -hmm. Give it up for power move maker, James Cruz. Thank you. How was that? How was that? Great job, great, great job. <laughs> I don't want to say that earth shit. <laughs>